Interesting instrument uh, for a reason. I mean, electric violin is nothing to play around with. Uh, why did you choose that for yourself? Like, what, what drew, drew you to that instrument? You wanted to learn it, play it, and make something out of it. Yeah, well, um, it's sort of like this evolution of uh, started started with classical uh, when I was in diapers, and then kind of was more interested in um, having fun with the instrument. You know, with classical. It requires a lot of discipline, a lot of it's it's like kind of like doing your homework, you know, your math homework or your, your chemistry work or whatever. It's sort of the equivalent in terms of the, the nuances of everything um, of the runs. And uh, I was looking to for a little bit of a little bit more leeway for creativity. So I ventured into electric violin land, which is sort of synonymous with. Um, well, basically works with uh, with playing along with a band with uh you know on, on a loud stage with with DJs with with other musicians other instruments with a PA system that type of thing so you found like your own um, your own gravitational pull towards it you know you touched pace on like classical music I mean I kind of I kind of feel the exact same way I feel like there's genres of music that you gravitate towards really well and then there's ones where you're like I don't know. I, I think like I can do better if I was doing something else. You feel me? Uh, are you saying you play a different genre? Yeah. Like in regards to like when you're playing music, cause I know like I play guitar mm -hmm. and I sometimes get fascinated by other genres of playing guitar, you know, like for example of how like picketing is very popular in country and blues sound, you know, on how like fast repercussions are very popular in punk, heavy metal and hard rock those type of elements and adding it into like your music palette and when you're making. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm always looking to explore different, different ways of making the violin fit into music. I find that certain genres work better than others, you know, EDM, rock, pop, uh, hip hop, obviously classical cinematic type music. Those, those are great for, for violin. Um, it, you know, but it, within the context of rock, I don't know how how well it fits into like alternative, for instance. You know, I wasn't like jamming along the music uh, in the '80s and '90s uh, music on the radio because a lot of it was all alt alternative uh, music that's kind of current, m more popular today in the top 40s tends to work a lot better with with uh, the electric violin. Uh, that being said, also the tones. You know, if you have an electric as opposed to an acoustic, there's more versatility um, in the tone. So I can make it sound like an electric guitar, which which would fit really well into like, you know, I don't know, Metallica song, whereas violin doesn't as much. So it's all like finding your element, I guess, like from what I'm hearing from what you're saying. And I like that. I like when, you know, you're you're an instrumentalist and you're playing an instrument and like you kind of have to accept that certain things just don't work. You know, certain things you can try and are really great, but on other avenues are just things that just don't work, period. Uh, I mean, like for yourself, I mean, with your music career and with all of the time that you spent, what if you could pick something out of your experience playing electric violin, what is like the one experience you regret the most? Regret? Regret the most. I'm just curious. Regret. Yeah. What experience do I regret the most of pl uh, out of uh, playing the violin? And, yeah, and like performing, like, and why? Well, this is an easy one, actually. Uh, dropping my bow on stage in front of, you know, 700 people. This is when I was college age, probably around like 19. And uh, the whatever, the the guy who was like the MC stood stepped back on my two thousand dollar bow and cracked it. And yeah, that was definitely something I regret <laughs> without a doubt. What did you what do you feel like you learned out of that experience? <laughs> Don't ever leave your bow out of the case. It's either behind your hand in your hand or in the freaking case. I uh, <laughs> Have not made that, you know, I, I'm, uh, now I'm just really anal about where I put my instrument. Um, 
and it's not i'm not i'm not like a, an ocd type of person i'm kind of the opposite but when it comes to that i just think okay do i want this to happen again and that's enough of a reminder you know i can't keep buying two thousand dollar bows no i mean yeah. eventually you know visa will be like uh Sir, we have a little bit of a problem with the card. There's been uh, multiple pur purchases of violin bows. Yeah. At random. Yeah, that's right. I I find that also, like, personally, I find that to be one of the hardest things for me playing instruments is just the fact of how expensive things are. You know, yeah, I know there are, like, cheaper alternatives. What do you gravitate towards more, like, in regards to equipment? Do you try to always get, like, high-quality things, or you don't really... Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm playing uh, 200 events a year, plus I'm doing live stream performances. I'm I'm constantly playing, so it isn't worth for, worth it for me to invest in half ass equipment for that obvious reason. Of course, yeah, it makes like, sense. You know, and, and and when um, you know Murphy's Law, like if you don't have everything perfectly aligned. Uh, the, the chances are greater that something wrong is going to happen, especially when the stakes are so high. So when it's like, you know, when you're, you're in front of a thousand people, that's when something's going to go wrong. Like somebody's like the sound guy's going to space out or a cable's going to crack. Like when you're most likely in a situation where you can be embarrassed, that's when things are going to go wrong. So I just try to give myself the edge and buy the best equipment I can, you know, Megami cables, the preamps, the, the strings are, are top notch. Uh, I have a backup violin, double violin case, just in case some of the pops cracks. Damn. So yeah, just, I, I can't tell you. Well just, equipped my dude, like he's got a backup violin, you know, can you imagine having a guy coming up on, just coming up on stage, breaks the guitar and is like, Hey Morty, grab me the other guitar from the. Yeah. Well, I, I remember when I was, uh, when I did, was was in a Greater Buffalo Youth Orchestra, yeah, when I was a kid, we we all used to kind of laugh because um, next to the conductor was a whole bag of he had a temper, but next to the conductor was a whole bag of batons. Oh my <laughs> so he's like, he's like, he he got really upset once at the whole orchestra. He cracked it. He cracked the baton, and you know he looks at it's broken half. People are kind of smirking. Throws it Sounds away. Italian. Because it is a bag. I don't I don't remember, <laughs> but uh, that was one of the most memorable. Uh, experiences for me no and i could i i i totally like understand that for to the fullest i mean i grew up in upstate new york and i grew up around italians no you way know, how far upstate i grew up like we call it upstate but we border jersey so I, oh. I grew up in rockland county and when i was growing up as a kid it wasn't as like populated as it as it is now it yeah. used to be this is crazy for a lot of people but like 20 yeah. years ago not even like 15 years ago when you left New York city and went to the other side of the Hudson, you know, and like, this is even for like people that are going to concerts. Cause people used to come out to Rockland and go to concerts, you know, in those open stadiums and people they would have like events and stuff. I remember it was rural, you know, there was like, there was tons of trees, you had tons of like little houses here and there. And just being in that environment, you know, having like a stage and just like this massive field, like 500 people there middle in, like kind of in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Outside well, of the city. Can you imagine that? Like, you know, you live in Manhattan. You're like, fuck this shit. I want to get out of here. Uh, I lived in Manhattan for 10 years and that's all I could think of. <laughs> so, I was in the Heights. <laughs> oh, damn. Which side? Which side were you, Usher? Which Both side? sides. The whole, yeah. the right, middle, and left. We're talking 10 years. Like, I was going from university and then, uh, but that's actually where my, I met my wife on the west side. So, Aww. good times, yeah. Upper west side story, honey. Well, Hope it didn't, I guess, Hope it didn't end as bad as the movie, but yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> the, so far, it's it's a, it's a pretty good tale, you know, over 15 years. But uh, oh, we got to the good. verbs. So. You're in New York currently? I am, yeah, uh, Long Island, but I'm from uh, uh, up upstate New York, uh, like Buffalo. So oh, okay. when you say upstate, I'm like, oh, how far upstate? You, you know what's so funny? People from Rochester, this is so hilarious. The only people from Rochester, whenever I tell them I'm a New Yorker, they give you that look. They're like, oh, what type of New Yorker are you? Where do you live? And I'm like, <laughs> I grew up in Rockland County. They're like, oh, you're not New Yorker. You're from New Jersey. You know, we're real, real New Yorkers. And I'm just like, 
I didn't have to deal with 15 inches of snow. I dealt with yeah. six. So I'm going to deal with my six. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, the Great Lakes. Do you feel do you feel in many ways that you as an artist really cultivated and grew because of the like being in New York, being around like that environment and your experiences or you being know, in Manhattan? Like, yeah, especially. I mean, you're constantly surrounded by culture, Broadway. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I, I, I've spent years playing with Broadway musicians, with people that have gone on tour, like Tony Bennett and like Frank Sinatra, a lot of big jazz performers. I mean, it, it literally made my career. Like, I don't think I would be a professional musician if I was living anywhere else other than New York, possibly LA, maybe Florida, but but New York is like the hub. So uh, it, it, again, it literally made my career. Like, I, I wouldn't have played all those major venues had I not had all these connections and, um, you know, over the last two decades. There's nothing, so. there's nothing like the, um, the artist scene in New York. You know, it's, I mean, I live here out in Florida and no offense to the artists out here. Like they're super incredible and super talented, but there, there, there's a whole different line in regards to the, the type of hustle, the type of environment you have to put yourself in. I, you know, if you want to talk about this, I'd love to hear like your, you know, your experience coming up into the scene and creating your career, just the amount of work and presence. I, I feel that you need to be, especially in the art scene in New York is definitely presence. You, you, de I feel like you definitely need to be present. Otherwise you just get, you get lost. You're saying uh, stage presence, or you're talking about just like present, physically present? If you're an artist that shows up at the same fucking club, you know what I'm talking about, the same fucking club in Lower East Side, every single Saturday at 6 p.m. for 10 years, that's all you do. You just go to the same place. I would that's probably lose my mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're great. You're a regular, and people know who you are, but like, what kind of career is that? You're not... Making I can't those imagine it's paying the bills. <laughs> exactly right. And like, yeah, I, I know a lot of people do that kind of waiting for like a label to come along and pick them up. It's kind of like winning the lottery. But uh, I, yeah, I, I, I started like I, I very much had a like a practical mentality in terms of. Let me just lower my volume a little bit. I don't know if I'm like overdriving. A little bit. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just like I looked at the label here um, we jiving we good bro okay cool uh do, 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 check one two there we go what was i saying yeah i mean i, I had a very much uh, very much a, a practical minded uh approach to to music because i i was really not i wasn't there for music i was there to get a degree and to you know pay, find a way to pay the bills and have like a, a stable job stable career um uh, music sort of like found me and it was just paying the bills for me throughout throughout college. So and then I just sort of made it a full time career. But yeah, I've been hustling since day one. I just starting physically hustling. Forget about even the schedule, but just like schlepping around the the MTA and and taking mass transit everywhere. I didn't have a car for like the first seven seven years. So I'm like running around with my equipment and amps and and rolling up and down, uh, uh, going up and down Broadway and like and these these stairs, endless stairs, uh, staircases at like 1 a.m. Coming back from really late gigs, uh, I was doing all that stuff just just it was paying the bills. So um, I, I didn't have a choice because uh, it's not like I had had another option. I didn't have people fill in my bank bank account. So it so. found. So what you're saying is it basically it found you. You're you're the type of artist where art. The artist, the artist in yourself found you, not the other way around. I did. I did. I was proactive about find, about getting the gigs, but it found me in the sense that like the opportunities came pretty quickly on my way because of just unique skills that I had, like the club date scene, the wedding, corporate events, the type of stuff like that. And people saw that I. I knew the repertoire. I was able to improvise, sight read, that type of stuff, and I had the I've equipment. Heard, so. I've heard some of your playing. You have a very unique way of how you play electric violin. 
I've heard other mm. like really famous people that have done that too, but I like the way that you do it. It's not too heavy. It's not too strong. If I listen to your music enough and somebody, I personally feel this, and somebody just started playing your music at random, I, I could, in a matter, I think in a matter of a few seconds, I can pick up that it's you. You have that, that type of sound that's quite unique. So it makes sense. It 100%, 100% makes sense that when you get into this, you know, you have these opportunities that are coming to you. How was well, that? Like how was that for you, though? I mean, besides the stress and the struggle of pulling things up 1 a.m. in the morning, just being there. Well, first of all, thank you. That's really nice of you to say. How was it? So, yeah, aside from the stress, there were a lot of nights where I just, like, I, I felt like, okay, this is the life. Like, this is, <laughs> this is what I'd like to spend my time doing instead of, like, getting a degree. But I was just trying to be uh, practical and get the degree. But... You know, just being on stage and jamming out and having a good time. But after like 10 years of doing that stuff, it actually gets a little bit uh, tiring. And then I, you know, I kind of look for other things to do. Like, you know, what's like, is this it? <laughs> like, am I going to be playing the same venues, playing with the same musicians every night? Like, I, I just felt like I needed something else. But as far as the stress of saying beyond, beyond of just like schlepping back and forth, obviously I needed a car. But even once I got a car... I needed like a little bit of a pay increase. So, uh, and then, and then the, what, what, what was bugging me the most was that I was playing other people's music. I think a true artist really needs to be creative in their own way instead of being mm -hmm. told like, okay, just even improv, even beyond improvisation, I guess I just sort of felt the need to just keep pushing the envelope until I found truly myself and like the release of neon dreams, which kind of marked the launch of my independent career as an artist that song is completely uniquely me. I was never playing anything like Neon Dreams uh, or <clears> Around <throat> the Road or anything like that. So uh, the amount of effort that it took just to like stay afloat, being an independent creative artist is a completely different bag of worms, completely different animal than, than it does being a club date musician and just kind of getting paid by booking agents. Yeah, come, come to this event and play, jam, whatever, jam out. Um, it's sort of like a trade-off between, okay, do I want to be creative and struggle as a creative artist? Um, or do I want to be less creative and just sort of, you know, be told what to do, but like have an easy paycheck. I felt like I kind of needed, needed to try something different. So I, feel I totally diverted from what you were asking about, but I just kind of, I don't know. No, 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 you, no, you're good. And I, I mean, I think that's really beautiful. And I think it's something that we as artists kind of forget. You know, we're, we have choice with our creativity, you know, to be an artist and to make a career, you know, have finances that are coming and you're able to do this on, on a day, on a daily -day basis. This is your living. But at the same time, you're able to have that creative flow. Like I said earlier, do you want to be that person that's stuck in the same joint in the Lower East Side for 10 years? I mean... Or do you want to go out of the box a little? Do you want to try something different? Why don't try something that will inspire something in you and maybe will give you another avenue of income that you never even realized before that was possible? Uh, yeah. So, you know, that's a risk that I chose to take. I could have just stayed stayed in the same the same place and continue to be booked and get busier and busy, busier. But first of all, the pay cap, was there uh, and that was pretty apparent to me <clears throat> and the uh and again again just like the oh um, basically the boredom you know it, it's ironic that i'm saying boredom because the very nature of what i do what i did since 2001 is like get up there on stage and rock out and have a good time but i don't know uh i don't know why i think this you're way not, i just feel like i need more you're not the only um you know slash he talked about this I was watching the documentary a few years ago, and he said that he went through a really horrible period. I mean, think Slash, you know, incredible guitar player. He went through a really horrible depression because he didn't feel creative. He didn't feel that he was going where he, he did. And in the mid-2000s, he switched things up, and he started making his own 
creations and riffs. And mm. I mean, it's fucking Slash. The guy's a legend, but he had his moment too. You know, each one of us have those moments. And I think that they're there, just like you said, to maybe help us not stay comfortable, but sometimes get out of our comfort levels a little bit, open up, see it a different way, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, we got one life to live. And uh, oh, yeah. I just think I, I, I saw this risk as being like, okay, if I, if I screw up, if I fail, I can always go back to where I was. Of course, I've never really made an effort to go back to where I was. And I thought it would be really easy to. Sorry, I got to, I got to fix what I just said because that's not true. When I was very sick about eight, eight, nine years ago, about eight, mm-hmm. nine years ago, I think. I was completely out of the business um, and I had to switch careers. But when I regained my strength and I was able to play the instrument again, which wasn't supposed to happen, I tried to get my foot back in the business. I was thinking this is going to be easy as cake because I was literally at the top. And it was hard as hell. It took a couple of years for me to really like build, you know, rebuild the reputation, rebuild the connections. And, re- and like I was reaching out to the agents that were booking me like crazy, like a few years prior. But and then I realized, okay, these guys didn't really have loyalty to me. Uh, they were riding off of my reputation. And that helped me helped me with a very new perspective on what it means to be an artist. And it actually was probably a blessing in disguise because it made me realize, okay, you know what? They I don't need a booking, I don't need to work for a booking agent that pretends to be incentivized alone, just just be in solely interested in booking me because they've got a good relationship with me. I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled now that I know the truth. Uh, these booking agents were booking me because I was being requested. Uh, it wasn't clear, but now I know because if they, if they had a different relationship with me, if they knew that like, if they, if they really truly felt that I was an asset to them just solely through performance, uh, as a performer and it wasn't just about me being requested, they would have just booked me like that and they didn't. So kind of, uh, shed some significant insight and it made me realize that, okay, uh, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to go down that path anymore. I'm going to invest in myself as opposed to into them. So I feel I never talked about this before. (laughs) No. And it's good that you bring it up because it's something that has been taken advantage of of artists for a very long time. I I feel that artists can understand artists. We can understand our pain. We can understand our trauma. We can understand our love and our passion for our creations and what we do. But when you have somebody, and again, there's nothing wrong. There are people that are great at accounting. There are people that are great at marketing. That's That's their passion in life. That's what they do really well. But you're not an artist. You're a marketer. You're a booker. You know, your job is to be the best person at getting somebody on the stage and wowing the audience and having a great night and getting your paycheck. So there's an indifference over here. We're how are you how are you supposed to connect with somebody like that and express your work and creativity to somebody that just views it as a dollar sign? Yeah. Well, that's part of what what led me away from it because and I, it's something I struggle with even today because on one hand, I need to pay the bills. On the other hand, I need to be creative. Otherwise, it's like soul-crushing work. Right. But I, I want to speak to the Slash thing. It was really interesting that you brought that up because he sort of popped up in my feed uh, different points. He I love Slash. Recently. Yeah, he's been collaborating with some vocalists. Mm-hmm. And I'm thrilled that he is... That he doesn't sing, right? And his new... And he just plays guitar, solely guitar, right? So that makes me so happy as an instrument. Guitar, and I think he plays bass. I'll fact that. Check this. Keep going. You know, what comes to mind is Joe Satriani. He's an instrumentalist. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. yeah, Over the 80s and 90s. And he was somebody I always sort of aspired to, I always admired. Because because he's not a singer. Because he's not not a lyricist. And the industry is literally all about vocalists, singers, like, and I get it. I understand people want to be able to sing the lyrics, but uh, I'm partial towards instrument uh, instrumentalism because, because of, you know, what I do. And I I think that there's, there's, I just think that there should be more, more, a little more attention paid. I'm not saying that, that the industry should be all all about instrumentalists and not vocalists. I think, I just think that, that 
you know, there should be more instrumentalists at the table. You know, it's sort of like, you know, within it's politics. Like, yeah, it, it's like take you know Ramones. You know, people forget that without Johnny Ramone and without Mickey Ramone, you know, drummer, guitarist, ba- people forget kind of the beauty about music is not always the person that's singing. It's sometimes the the music and the soul that comes from it. You know what I mean? As an instrumentalist, I do. Yeah. And I look forward to that in music. You know, a lot of people don't realize like, oh my God, like to tell you honestly, like the truth, if I meet like a band, I'd rather meet the instrumentalist than the, than the lead singer because they're a lot more fun to hang out with, to be honest. I'm assuming you're an instrumentalist. Yeah. I mean, I play guitar, you know, and I, I, I sometimes like have where I make songs, but I sometimes just love creating riffs and rhythms, progressions, and just see where it takes me. S- words are beautiful, but sometimes you don't need words for communication. Sometimes you need emotion, feeling, ambiance. That's how you connect. Yeah. Amen to that. I don't always like telling people what to, what to think or what to do or the message, you know, my pers- like to, yeah. it's my perspective completely. Like you can take it as any way you want, but yeah, I agree with you. It's like, you know, use the general idea and interpret it and, and apply it to, uh, to your life, but just mm-hmm. be inspired and, and, uh, make it a good thing, you know, make it a positive, positive thing in your life. And that's really just my agenda. So. Yeah, and it's also, if you want to, like, walk me through this, because I'm actually curious, like, when you're putting together your chords on, you know, on your instrument, just the thought process that's going into your head, just think about that, of, you know, you're putting together this piece. It's kind of like you're making something in the process, and it's just, it's so beautiful. Just to think that that is a process that every single instrumentalist goes through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the melody comes first for me, even mm-hmm. when I'm writing songs that yeah. that have lyrics. But uh, maybe that'll change. That's just where I'm at right now. I've been focusing on instrument uh, instrumental music for the most part, but this past year I've been collaborating with uh, like vocalists like... Uh, you know, like Porter Singer, for instance, a couple other vocalists. I, I don't want to mention yet, but um, known vocalists that I'm very excited to uh, to share with the world very soon. That's so, great. Collaboration yeah. is awesome. I, I, you know, I. This is my like just little thought. One of the first pe- one of the very first per- person to ever create the perfect kind of way of collaboration for artists was Andy Warhol. Because he realized a very simple thing that we do this with social media now. How do you get artists to inspire other artists? You take other artists to a comedy show. You take an artist to opera houses. You take artists to a place where people are performing. You bring people together and they start talking. What you're doing is when you're working with these, these singers, these creators, you're taking your work and they're bringing their work. And then you're talking about it and you're creating something together. Now you just added to yourself this experience with this other person, their own thought process, their own way of creating and bringing that together with your own creation. It's just, it's so freaking simple, but yet so complicated. Collaborations, yeah, are exactly that. They are so simple, but they're so complicated. (laughs) I, I have tried, I have tried quite a few times over the last couple of years to to collaborate with artists that should have been really like, it should have just been a real quick here. Here's the track, lay it down. Like we work together, Let's like go. just on one song. Like it's literally like, like it's virtually no effort and it doesn't cost you anything except for like maybe an hour. Who cares? It's like, and you get your return, but people, artists are proud. And, um, you know, I, I mean, that being said, you know, I've rejected uh, a number of offers for, for collaborations, but I don't, I don't know. I, I don't find myself to be as picky as a number of artists that are, are, are they're, we're not talking all that big, just like, you know, talented. And like, what do you have to lose? Like, you really have to stick to your exact genre. You can't pivot a little bit to the right or a little to the left. If people enjoy your music, you know, and you play 
classical, for instance, and you're a cellist, what's a little bit of like dance cello going to kill kill your audience? You think you're going to lose people? It's just uh, people are silly, very idealistic, and um, I, I don't know. I, I, it, it's I, always a process. There's there's a new thing now that I've noticed in clubs, especially out here in Florida. I I'm going. It's kind of fun. They're taking disco. So this is a new thing. They take disco and they mix it with EDM. So it is so funny to just watch these teenagers, like 16, 17 year olds, like screaming out a Donna Summer, like Donna Summer song. And you're just like, they, they were like born in like the early, like mid 2000s and they know who Donna Summer is. It's just hilarious. Yeah. But it's again, like you said, like, just go for it. Just, you know, what do you got to lose? You know, if you just try to go a little bit this way, or try to go a little bit that way, try to connect maybe this way, you know, just being a little bit lenient and being less tough on yourself and, and less, you know, being just so stiff, being like, no, I would loosen up, go with the flow, yeah. man. It's okay. You know, it's like not that big of a deal. Yeah. There's, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of rigid, a lot of rigidity out there that I know is oh talented yeah. people. Like, uh, I don't know if it's an artistic pride. Uh, I guess that rigidity exists in any sort of workplace. I mean, I've, I've worked in other before, before I went back to music, um, you know, I was in the thick of education and I met all sorts of inflexible people. Uh, but I also met some really flexible, really wonderful people. You just have different personalities. I just, I find that like disproportionately more that is in the, the music industry. And I think cause people have so much pride, take so much pride in their music. I take a lot of pride in my music, but, uh, you know. A collab's a collab, so if it's ha if it's decent music, why not? So I'm hoping to score a whole lot more of those um, in the next few months because it's it's just been it's great ride. The ones the ones that I have successfully collaborated with, it's it's just been so rewarding, you know. And it really it really opens up to it also opens up to this new dynamic and I, I really try to keep this type of philosophy of open-mindedness mm -hmm. and <clears throat> one thing you realize you have one life you know you get one life whether it happens after you live i don't feel like that matters for myself i feel like what matters the most is experiences and the things that you learn along the way you know with a career such as yourself i mean you said about 15 years is it more than that Oh uh, well, yeah. Career, career wise, uh, twenty. Damn, twenty, twenty one years. <laughs> twenty one yeah. year career. Professional, yeah, on yeah. and off. Uh, but but the last over the last seven years, it's been like a hundred percent non, you know, uh, full time. So I mean, there's a, there's a lot of wisdom and a lot of things you can learn along the way in that amount of amount of time, and. Yeah. You can really give that over with the message to your audience, you know, the people that you work with. I really like that attitude that you took, you know, you eventually came down the road and you're like, am I, am I going to basically sell my soul at the crossroads or am I going to do something for myself and try to figure out a way of making this financially beneficial for myself oh, yeah. and keep me afloat, yeah. you know, it, it all comes down to like, where are you? Like, where do you like? I've had to ask myself this so many times, even with this podcast, you know, with any project that you do. It's so, it's so heavy. Yeah. It's as, as much of an easy time as I, as I was explaining that I, I have had starting out music in 2001, professionally getting paid to do that stuff um, on a part-time basis and then a full-time basis. Being an independent artist is really, really difficult, but it's that much less difficult if you're, you truly enjoy it. As they say, you know, you never work a day in your life if you really love what you do. So, but I choose the harder path. Uh, you know, I got to wear a lot of hats. You got to have a business sort of acumen, business uh, frame of mind, and uh, you can't really depend on people. I mean, even if you're, even if you're, you sign a contract with a major label. I know a number of uh, artists who have 
you know, they, you're not, you're not living the high life. There are very small percentage of people that succeed, even those who get signed. I mean, you look at the, like, you can think of it as getting signed to the NFL or the NBA or something like that. And what percentage of those success, what's, what percentage of those, what percentage of those people, the football players, basketball players are actually achieving real success? Very, very small percentage, yeah. like 1%. Yeah, you don't really think about it. And the crazy part is there are some people that are super famous. I mean, we're talking about like millions of followers on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. And guess what? They're broke as fuck. They're poorer than most people. You know You know why? Because they sign these contracts. And yeah, they're only getting like, I remember reading somewhere it's like, okay, I, this is how I understand it. You probably can process this better than I, I can. It, they basically make a deal where they give you a million dollars, but they have to um, they have to have some way of having assets if you don't make those million dollars. So they mm-hmm. take your your million dollars and they put it towards like collateral. So and then because it 360 has 360 deals. Yes. They're nasty. <sighs> Yeah, I've I've been in these like funnels, these like major label funnels, indie artists that are connected to the major labels. They fund you to the major level labels. They 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 just like bring people in and then they like automate these messages, like targeting you, making you feel like they really want you. And then you got to pay to do this and to do that and to attend the webinar, and you got to pay this to to like get in to get a, an online like like interview or, or meeting. With like a, a manager, um, it's like a whole. I don't want to say Ponzi scheme because it's not like, you know, it's it's not illegal underground work. It's just no. it's it's just a little like kind of just feels kind of dirty, you know? Yeah, I, yeah, because because you're especially because you're earning and you're profiting off of people that are really struggling. I mean, a lot of struggling artists that are kind of hoping to make it, and it, yeah, you just you gotta I. I I'm just uh, I've I I feel more comfortable kind of doing things on my own as much as possible as difficult as it is because I can control everything you know if I screw up I, it's not because somebody else screwed me up it's because I screwed me up. So. This is kind of the thing where I kind of love about Podmatch, where it's allowed me as a podcaster to talk to people like you. You know, before I would have had to jump through loopholes and you know. Uh, this agency and that manager and this person and that person. I'm like, what? You know, I have to deal with some of that shit to get some guests on. Like I have had some people I've been trying to get on where it's, oh my God, how many fucking loopholes do I have to go through and reschedulings do I have to deal with? Um, It's sometimes so nice to just be able to talk to the person directly you know, and be able to have that direct experience and that that position. Because how are we supposed to grow as people if we can't have conversations with one another? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when there's a lot of money at stake and, uh, know. and a lot of investors and a lot of a lot of inv- a lot of stakeholders in the product, which is the singer or the 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 headliner. The headliners, first of all, own. So the headliner doesn't own, doesn't own their creativity necessarily, or their or their um, anything else. So they're they, just they a label. To... They're they're a label. That's pretty much what the marker ticket is. They're representing yeah. that brand, one hundred percent. Yeah, which has got to be a little bit soul sucking in itself, because like while you get to create music and people are like screaming your name, you don't get to decide where to go and what to do. And I mean, you you watch these interviews with Michael Jackson. He was depressed going on tour. He hated touring because the guy was owned. He was owned up the butt. Like he was obviously had a lot of other problems, but uh, yeah. And I know a number of like celebrity singers that are, that are owned. I was used to think like, oh yeah, I'd love to be that. But um, nah, they did. It's a lot of stress. So that's kind of nice. There's pros and cons to being in my position, but uh, that's one of the pros. Yeah, and I I love that you bring that up because, again, it's an honest perspective. You know, the thing is, we have to be realistic as people, you know, and and if you're not open to being able to see that there are pros and cons, because look, like no 
situation is going to work perfectly. Perfectly, There's always going to be consequences to your actions. There's always going to be an issue and a problem that you're eventually going to have to deal with. But, you know, the ultimate goal is, right, if you're passionate about what you're doing, and this is what you want to do, and you want to work towards, again, like, the only thing that's stopping you, I feel, is yourself. <clears throat> you as an individual. Uh, yeah, so... Just sort of expanding to that, upon that, I just wanted to say that the person who has the most flexibility in their decision making, whether they're signed to a label or whether they're independent, is the person who knows their customers and, and, and knows how to reach their customers. And I'm pretty sure, well, I don't, I can't say, say anything for sure, but but the labels, they own the customers. I don't know how much the, the 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 headliners or the artists even have access to the customers. Obviously, there's social media, but you know, I, I, if you've got the audience, that's pretty much people are going to follow your lead. Like, there's nothing a manager is going to take away from you if you right. own the audience. The audience is coming to you, so that's pretty much they're the most important ingredient in in the musical game. So I take, I take my fans, my listeners, my supporters very seriously. Whenever they message me, I take it very seriously because they are literally the bread and butter. They are the core of my, and they're my inspiration too. So Mm -hmm. I love comedy. And they don't have to be, they don't have to be listening to me. They can be doing anything else. There's millions of other forms of media that they can be consuming and they decide to uh, connect with me. And so I'm deeply touched and I'm honored. And uh, I just hope that I can keep making music for them. It's a so. it's a really beautiful way of connecting with your audience. I mean, I, I I try to take that that standpoint for myself. I mean, I try to do that with, especially with guests that I have on, because I feel that in many ways you're opening up people to something that maybe I'm passionate about, maybe something that somebody else is passionate about, maybe inspiring somebody. You never know. You never know who's listening. But the greatest thing that you can be is having people that like love what you're doing, you know, they want to connect to it. They, they're like, Oh my God, like when, when you're doing your next thing and they know that they connect to you and they know that there's that feeling of openness, you know, you know, you know, those artists where people, they have an audience, but if you ask anybody that's a fan of theirs, they're going to be like, Oh yeah, I love that person, but they were completely closed. Yeah. You know, mostly because, or a lot of artists, they just they don't they don't have the time or the energy to no. to deal with oh no their fans uh uh-uh. uh so that's sort of like a it's a trade off uh, I'm not sure why people feel the need to like post under under a post of a celebrity that has like gazillion comments the celebrity's never gonna never gonna respond to you they're not gonna gonna even look at your comment but people do it anyway. I, I don't know. I it's kind of odd because when you're on social media, you have millions of followers. How are you supposed to connect to those people? I mean, it's impossible. There, there's really no way of actually like connecting to those people. I don't really see the point. <laughs> I don't see. I don't. But uh, I guess pe- people get excited by like Taylor, Taylor Swift. You know, uh, they want to connect with her. But I, I, it's like one in a million that's actually able to. How many people is she DMing? I'm not sure how that works. I know. I know. And it, you remember, like I said earlier, a lot of the times, um, especially like when you're dealing with certain people, you have to go through agencies. Yeah. You can't necessarily talk to the person directly. And a lot of the times, unfortunately, whoever you're speaking with, they're very choosy and picky. So they might not even tell the person that they're representing that they're doing this. So you may like be going on this string. I I heard this from somebody that told me this. We're they were dealing with an interview. Um, I'm not going to give out any names. And the person that they were dealing with never told the person they were actually interviewing, and kept on this string for like four or five months. So the way he figured it out was like he was getting like you know kind of the generic responses. You know what I'm talking about? Like oh, sorry, this and this happened. Oh, I'm sorry, we have to yada yada. That kind of mm-hmm. that kind of crap. And he was like, 
what's going on over here? This is like copy and paste, copy and paste. So he was able to reach out to her, um, her producer directly. He got the, the email to the producer and I, I just, I, I find it like for myself, this freaks me out a lot. You know, we're, it just worries me of like how much, why do we need so much tape? Why do we need to close ourselves? I get it. Like there's security and there's crazy people out there. But again, like if we want to be able to connect and grow as a community, as artists, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. You know, a lot of the red tape is uh, money, Mm -hmm. money related stuff. Oh my, everything's money. One control. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I honestly, I feel kind of bad for t- Taylor Swift. I, I don't think I'd want to be in a position where she can't go outside and without people of the paparazzi chasing her down the street. I mean, what kind of life is that? Yeah, I know. Some people want it. Uh, I, there's definitely a downside. You know, you, you can live in your your uh, 50 acre estate, but uh, doesn't it get a little lonely if you can't just go out in the public and just be yourself? People forget that money is as wonderful it is as it is you know when you become financially stable there's still other things you have to deal with like life doesn't just turn into utopia paradise the second you become financially stable you know my, my brother gave me this advice you know because he became financially stable for himself he's like don't think your problems get solved just because of money it's not the only issues you're going to run in in with in your life there's a lot of other things that you're going to deal with for sure. Money is just the, the tip of the iceberg. Lots of happy people that don't have money anyway. <clears throat> what kind of thing? I mean, if you want to open up about this, you can. What are some of the things that you've had to deal with besides money for yourself as an artist? So, well, so money's money has been a struggle over the years for me as an artist. Support. I mean, I've, I've had bigger bills than other people. You know, I'm not living in an apartment. I have a family support. I have a house I got to manage. Right. So, and then I got bills. So, you know, it's not like, so I have to, er, I have to be earning a full time income as a musician for this to work, to be in the space, to have a studio, that type of stuff. But struggles beyond that include like sort of the, the lack of nine to five-ness of, of my career. I'm, I'm more, I'm a workaholic and I'm working around the, around the clock, producing, collaborating, outperforming at night. So I do some day events, but, uh, it, it's not so conducive to raising a family and to, to having a spouse, but I make sure that it works because it's important to me. Um, I know a lot of people where it has not worked. Uh, maybe that's cause that's their choice. I don't think that Doing what I do uh, is, means that it, that you can't, you know, be happy with a family. It just means that it's a little bit more of a struggle. Yeah, I, I love that you br- I love that you bring this up because I think it's really beautiful when artists are able to create a family like you did. You know, it it really shows that no, it's not just about drugs and girls and sex and TV. You know, you can you can have a family, you can have kids, you can have a house. And be a professional artist. Yeah, I mean, obviously the drug, sex, and that stuff, like that, that sells. Uh, and I think I that that's why it's been the in the mainstream since time immemorial. I've seen a number of artists that don't represent that, that have succeeded and thrived. And for that very reason, I continue to pursue what, you know, the independent artist track because I realize, okay, this is doable. I don't have to be fucked up in the head in order to make, in order to be able to earn, earn a living, um, and doing what I love. It frustrates me to no end that, that again, those people are, that those are the majority, uh, pushed by the industry. Cause again, it sells uh, every day. I work against that to try to sort of change the, change the norm the mainstream um, in my own little microcosm. Not so easy, but i um, definitely trying. <laughs> it's, it's like our own little worlds, you know, each one of us, each and every one of us has our own little earth. Yeah. Well, the music industry is, is changing uh, as 
more independent artists find ways of earning a living. And, uh, you know, that's, that's going to reshape the, uh, you know, the, the top forties if, if it hasn't already. So I, I think also artificial intelligence will be a really great tool. I know people are terrified of it, but I think it's going to be a really, oh, yeah. I think it's going to be a great tool for artists because think about it, like in 20 years, you know, if you have an artist that's struggling and trying to figure out something in their head, you know, they can go into an artificial intelligence hub, you know, on their computer and like, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to put this together. And then they can have this artificial intelligence help them try to put it together and give them different ideas of what they can do. You know, you may see look at that as, as cheating, but guess what? I'm an artist and I use tracing paper. It's not cheating. It's another way of creating. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that's beautiful. I think. Oh, did you say drawing? You draw? Yes, I do. I'm an artist. That's funny. You said tracing paper because this, this, I saw like an ad a couple days ago, this, I forgot the name of the unit, but it's literally a unit where the, there's like this prism where there's this, uh, a mirror that reflects, I guess the, for instance, if you're drawing somebody's face, you're lo- you're able to look, I'm really not describing this very well. You're, you're I know able to kind of I know you're, to, I know you're, I know you're, I know what you're talking in two about. different directions. Yes. And you're able to trace the person's face on, on the paper below while you're looking through this projection and that's something that apparently like Leonardo da vinci used or so it's cheating but it's okay whatever (laughs) it's not cheating you know like people gave shit for when they i forgot what they call that shit where they used to put in like parts of songs like vanilla ice did that with under pressure uh the, the, the riff yeah uh and countless times but again I just feel as artists, we learn from one another. We get spontaneous and creative, and we just want to see what we can make out of it. Uh, I don't like to, you know, people are like, oh, that's cheating. You know, it's not, you know, individual. Or I'm like, bro, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, people People obviously, this is in the, going back to what we were talking about. People need to lighten up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Everybody's afraid of like losing work to, to whatever, somebody who knows how to game the system. It, we all use, use tools and we're all going to continue to use tools and people who don't, who choose not to use them will be left behind inevitably. People who have chosen not to use social media for better or for worse. Many people have been left behind. Their businesses have, have failed. So it's sort of like a, it's a, it's just, it's just the name of the game. You know, um, you can't get around in a horse and buggy anymore. You know, you got to drive a car. Otherwise, you can't you can't pay the bills. Right. And we're all going to have to use AI inevitably in the next uh, few years, if not now. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to keep up. Yeah. And I, I, I think especially for the artist industry, I think the more that you fight it, the worse it's going to be. I think that it needs to be embraced, especially with the artist community, because I feel it's yeah. going to help artist you know from any type of level to be able to create things you know and it also opens up new types of artists you know did you ever think about an artist that uses artifice artif- artificial intelligence singularities so uses the program itself algorithm to create things out of feelings like sounds yeah i don't know if you heard about this like you can take a yeah, vibration yeah, and it can create mm-hmm. There are people that are really good at this. They know exactly mm-hmm. what to input. That is a form of creativity and being an artist. Like, this is the new age that we're entering, and I'm excited. Yeah, well, I'm glad you are. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm excited. I'm a little fearful also, but I'm sure that, you know, I, I can't imagine people are just going to be sitting home and unable to earn a living. I'm sure that there there's going to be changes that will just adjustments made, you know, the government level at the AI level so that people will con- continue to earn a living. It's just going to be a very different ball game. And, uh, I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah, I guess we, I guess we will see. Let's embrace the future. <laughs> if there is one, um, <laughs> it depends on who gets elected next. Oh my God. I, I, I've been keeping up with that stuff, and it's just like, first off, I make this joke all the time. We're like, look, 
okay, I wasn't alive in the 60s and I couldn't vote for a Kennedy. All right. It is the two, you know, like it's the 2000s. And just for shits and giggles, just like we vote for Mickey Mouse every four years, I <sighs> vote for. Ken- but the thing that I, I always inspire and linger to is a person of thought, sane of mind and openness. Like the second that somebody's like that, I'm like, I want to hear what they have to say. You know, I've just, yeah. I've been just blown you know, away. I, I don't think it takes much once it doesn't take much for these presidential candidates to, to just be reasonable in my opinion. I, but just all the candidate, just a lot of the candidates and, and obviously our current president and our left previous president, you speak with anybody and most people are just really dissatisfied with, with the options. And uh, I don't, I don't mean to make this a political conversation. Oh no. It's but cool. I'm just wondering how long it's going to take for like a candidate to be selected that the people actually want to be voted in to office as opposed to, as opposed to the situation where people just feel like, okay, like we have no control up there at the top because the bigger, more powerful elements at um, at play are choosing who the candidate should be. See, this is this is the thing though about RFK that I have a fear of. See, honestly, if we look at our country in the past hundred years, one of the most influential people that really changed our country was JFK. In his short period, he really opened up and changed a lot of things in this country. And I really feel the same way with RFK because this man has so much to lose. Like, he could be assassinated just like his father did and so just like his uncle did. 100%. There is a very high chance he will be assassinated. And I'm not, like, threatening the guy, but that's just a reality for somebody like him. Apparently, RFK Sr., the one who got assassinated... Apparently, well, from what I heard on the radio recently, he got assassinated because he had mentioned that he wanted to reopen an investigation on JFK, his brother's assassination, which totally makes sense to me. But what brings what calls into question is who is it that 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 set into motion to Ooh. assassinate him? And that's what I want to know. And I don't know why it's. Why no? But why, why there are all these like? Well, JFK wanted JFK wanted to get rid of the central intelligence. He wanted oh, the CIA. Yeah, he wanted to eradicate. Why did he want to? Why? Yeah. Because he believed that, you see that they're corrupt. Yes, he 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 huh. he, he genuinely Can you believe- how corrupt they are now. If they're corrupt back then, that's been like fifty years of. Build up a buildup of corruption. That's all I watch. Sorry to interrupt you. But that's all I watch with my wife at night. We're watching CIA, CIA, the CIA that like just Marvel movies based off the CIA, just like pretty much everything built around how fascinating it is that CIA is corrupt from the inside out. Just like they created the, <laughs> just like they created the Charles, by the way, Charles yeah. Manson was created by the CIA. He was, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, he was brought I, I in. <laughs> he was taught, and they created this whole what? thing to basically break down. I watched this on the Joe Rogan podcast. Oh my this god, that's crazy. insane! Oh my, where, where'd you watch it? On Joe Rogan podcast. I, that's, oh look, my god! Yeah, really? Joe Rogan experience, bro. Every oh day, my god. every fucking day. He's a legend. He's Joe. A, oh my god, he is such a fucking. But it, it, the, the, <laughs> the thing is, and I kind of agree with JFK. He said this so beautifully. Yeah, we need to be able to protect ourselves, but why can't the people know? What are you so scared of the people knowing? Like, what are you scared of us as human beings, like, knowing about, oh, I don't know, about warfare that's going on in other countries while we have people here that are starving, that we have horrible health care in this country. Hello? Is anybody well, going to look at the Pentagon? You know, you could ask that question. I mean, all these agencies are corrupt and granted we're lucky that there's a somewhat of a balance of power, but it's one like the faith that the American people have in the, in the, the FDA, the, the USDA, the CIA, the FBI, the, like all of these industries, it's like, it's dropped from like 70% to like 30, 40%. It's a joke. Let me like, why? 
they're me... going to get dissolved. That's why. That's why they're afraid. That's what they're afraid of. I was. I was born in 1999, so I wasn't alive um, when the World Trade Center came down, and that's when they created the Homeland Security and the TSA. And I remember as a kid, because I grew up in the early 2000s. When we went to the airports, the gradual changes that went on in the airports, I remember them slowly. They went from you couldn't take water anymore on the plane to you couldn't bring plastic utensils. Then you couldn't do this. And I just remember as a kid looking at my mom and I'm like, what's going on? And she was like, she couldn't explain it. Like everyone was confused. That's how it was. Like people were so confused for so long we forget this shit i remember this as a kid but like we forget how confused and conflicted we were 20 years ago like i i want to tell you yeah if you go if you go back to the middle east conflict that's funny how this has turned to a political show uh oh this is great fi- fucking a the Let's 50s, go. i love i love hater comments i look forward to them uh, in the 50s that was believe it or not and it's not it's not touted as such, but if you really like dig dig in, I was kind of researching like the Six Day War in Israel and like the well the and the fifties and the sixties, like the whole conflict between the Syrians, Lebanon, Egypt, blah blah blah. These were all pro- those are proxy wars back then. Like we've been doing proxy wars in the last 20, 30 years, like the Gulf War and like, like all these yeah, all these wars, Afghanistan War, yeah, uh, the the Korean War, whatever, all that stuff. And and yeah, this has been a a game that's been played. You know, not so much World War II. That's sort of like known as a very kind of a di- different animal. But subsequent to just, that, it just, just like make, just to yeah. let you know. By the way, World War II could have complete been completely avoided. I read. Well, that, I watched the whole documentary on this. There, there interesting. Yes, Where, who was <clears throat> the documentary presented? By? It was on um, Netflix. I had a friend of mine that sent it to me. Um, a long time ago, it's about a year, year or so ago. Um, I, it was, I forgot the title. I'm going to check my, um, basically in short, it kind of broke down the war. It's like one of those, like the series where like, it kind of, you probably see this on Netflix. It basically breaks down the war by years. So like 19, you know, 30 to 1935, that's the first episode. And then 1935 to 1939, what's really interesting was they knew what was going on. Because if you in Nazi Germany, you're saying correct. Because they were printing papers in the United States in the early 30s, so everyone in the United States knew what was going on in Germany. And the thing was, is Americans were being warned by Europeans and the UK already in the mid 30s that there's conflicts going on. There's pro. This was just complete ignorance for 10 years. That's what you learn. Well, complete ignorance for 10 years. Just complete like, oh, it's okay. It's going to blow over. Well, I think there was a hope that it was going to blow over because everybody wants to avoid, a, you know, a third world war or a whatever. You know, China, there's 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 right. heat right now. You know, there's this uh, there's North Korea. There's Russia. Like we don't nobody wants to go get into a nuclear war no. situation. Um, so if, if there's stuff brewing, people are going to try to find alternatives. But uh, to to try to uh, try to appease, but if, if it's not happening, it's not happening. Um, but but back to my my point of like the fifties and sixties, proxy wars have been around for a very long time, and it's just sort of like been capitalists versus the communists. Like that's really been what that's been the common denominator, the common theme for the last 50, 60 years, manifested in different ways through these poor countries like Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, and M- Middle East, and like everybody fighting for like oil and. Uh, resources and I granted I I I am I I've not spent a lot of time lo- you know learning about geopolitics but the little that I do know it's it's not you don't have to dig too deep to see the 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 hand at play with the proxy wars this all this all affects us in many ways because you know you're talking about the 50s and the 60s look what they did to the artist community with the Vietnam War they tried well, yes. they tried to destroy as much as they possibly could and guess what that's never going to happen was nixon yeah yeah i mean nixon there are just so many movies that that uh oh he oh, rotten that hell been, that piece of shit 
Well, yeah, there's not, it's funny. And you're saying that as somebody who, who was born 2000, it's like really like the media has just taken a dump all over him. He did. He left such a trail of like corruption. We have, we have substance one with psychedelics and cannabis. I'm a cannabis user and I've been using it for four years and I haven't and medically was incarcerating people for, for generations. And you're saying. the only reason why, and the person, one of his right hand man, industry. Yeah said this in 1977, he <laughs> said the only reason why that they created the whole Schedule One, the whole war on drugs, was to separate the black and Latin community so they can be able to enlist them d during the Vietnam War and has less, less conflict because of all the rioting that was going on and people coming together from different communities. They created the drug war to divide this country. Wanted they wanted the black. Wait, was this recorded verbatim by? This was found in documents in regards to conversation. But his right, Nixon's right hand man, right -hand man, wanted the blacks and Hispanics to enlist in the war. The Correct. Vietnam war. That's what they wanted administration, <laughs> and they oh they they felt that if they did this, Nixon would have a better chance of winning. So. This was around the time, like so, 1970. They passed this law, and like. They're not doing this because they care. It's just because Nixon wants to win his next election as president. Even though this is almost 50 years ago, look where we are right now. I'm like, bro, how many times do Americans and us as individuals have to be smacked in the face to realize, like, this is really unfair. They're trying to divide people. By gender, by sexuality. Yeah, yeah, they're still trying to divide. Yeah. yeah, like now we have to represent who we are. I have to fucking yeah, tell yeah. you, gay, and yeah. like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, no. Why can't we just yeah. be just people? Like, like we're doing right now here. It doesn't matter who we are or where we come yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our experiences. Yeah. What matters is is that we're here now, and we're here coming together for a reason and a purpose. Yeah. The the topic of like of of race of of religion this stuff is always is constantly brought up in the media by pol by politicians both sides they're both guilty uh and it, it pisses me off to no end because it's they're they are riding off of that tension uh in order to to gain power uh to in order to pander to their base and it's just it's unconscionable it's really just it's, it's i'm hoping it'll end at some point I, that people will catch on but I don't know because it may just be the same story rep repeated from from administration to administration because it's a game that works. You know, this is how you get people excited and excited to vote for the next candidate. You know, the right and the left are cut from the same cloth. Most people don't see it that way. That's how I see it. And mm -hmm. they both pander to their base and they both are looking for power. And uh, granted, they both represent like different nuanced uh, perspectives, but they are cut from the same cloth. And uh, it makes me wonder if there shouldn't be a third party. I, I, I have this thought of a what if. What if RFK did win? What if he did win and because? Truthfully, I, I don't want to you know pick sides or anything, but his chance of winning is is next to nothing. He's not going to win. But if he mm -hmm. if he did... What would happen, you're saying? Yeah. I don't know. It's a great no, question. No clue. I have no clue. But... Uh, the more... As people are more disenchanted, it boils down to jobs and income, really. If right. the economy is doing well, people don't care. Like, you put in whatever shithead you want, you know, into the presidency. That's his focus is, is economy and welfare. You yeah, know, that, that's everybody's focus. It's the senator's focus. It's the legislature's right. fo focus, because that literally keeps people calm and relaxed. As the economy drops, tanks, uh, then there's blood in the streets, and then people start taking sides, and uh, that's right. what happens conflict. historically. Right. Yeah, conflict. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, I I'm hoping that uh, you know we can just continue to ride out the wave with these. Uh, corrupt politicians because nobody's going to feel the need to change anything because uh, people are going to be earning a living. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping things can be better than that, but uh, that's Hence the, uh, what I'm expecting. 
hence the Great Recession in 2030. <clears throat> be prepared. It's oh, gonna be. It's gonna be a bumpy. Uh, I. I. I psh. You think it's gonna be a bumpy ride? It's gonna be a bumpy ride, one hundred percent. I mean, I. I feel that there are gonna be a lot of negatives that come out of it, but I think there's a lot of pluses. I mean, we've talked already for past hour or so, and about the progression of artists. I mean, you starting your career in the early two thousands. I mean, now for people that are having careers now for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and so on how are things going to be for independent artists? You know, what is the world going to look like for an independent artist when there's a great recession in 2030? Maybe it's going to be all gloom or maybe we'll be the ones to entertain people while they're miserable. I don't know. I'm hoping, I'm hoping the, the latter, but uh, I, <laughs> I, I, I think that inflation is going to play the biggest role, you know, I mean, the income my father had to to earn in order to raise four kids, really just in the 80s and 90s, is a, a per, very small percent, like 50% of what we have to earn now. And we have to, maybe a third. I mean, to raise a family here out in Long Island, uh, you need triple. So it's probably even more. So especially to send them to private school. But it's uh, the inflation is playing the major role. It, 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 it pisses me off more than anything when... My parents reminded me of my dad bought a camper, like a 73 camper in, in 70, I think 77 for $300. And oh, then well, like, let, let me plug in my, sorry, let me plug in my laptop. Give me one second. Hold on that. one second. Uh, let's see. So like, we, and then on top of that, my parents bought a, like they bought a house for $32,000 in 1980. I'm like, why can't yeah. I buy a brand new house for thirty, yeah. you know, thirty thousand dollars? Okay, uh -huh. that's not even the down payment. Now, now you need a hundred thousand, and then you got to pay paying like, you know, the, I mean, homes on Long Island are like, like if you don't want to live in a hole in the wall with mold, you got to be spending like half a million, a and. <laughs> You know, you win the lottery, you win a million dollars. What does that get you? It's just the inflation's out of control. It's really just out of control. It it really is. Exactly. And, the thing that, you know, can be very struggling is the struggle itself, you know, being like, oh, my God, this is so hard. This is so difficult. But you touched on, like, starting from little things, you know, being able to, I think, be able to slowly progress and grow and, and figure out what you need and what you don't need. And it's just so slow. I feel like wisdom and learning is just you get smacked in the face you fall, you trip, you pick yourself up. And you do no it way to do it. Yeah. The grind. Got to pick yourself up, yeah. <sighs> well, I enjoy the grind. <laughs> <laughs> what is it um what has it been for you now? I mean, like where where are you currently present as an artist? Uh, you're saying in terms, in terms of what I'm doing uh, yeah. performance-wise? Yeah. So I'm I'm doing a blend of things, uh pretty eclectic just because I enjoy not doing one specific thing. So I'm doing you know, live performances, studio work, collaborations, private events, public events, uh, fundraising events, traveling, trying to stay local at different points. Nice. Just mixing it up. I enjoy it. With the locals. I love that. Yeah. Well, well you know, I, I, don't, I used to travel like three times a month out to LA and I, I just loved it. And then I just kind of got old after a while. <laughs> It's so like, okay, you know, I don't know how much I need to do it. I mean, but Atlanta, Texas, you know, every couple of weeks. You know, LAX kind of, you, you kind of get sick of LAX after uh, going it's, there. Yeah. They, I think they upgraded recently, so it's probably a little nicer. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, that's that's really great. I mean, you're, you're able to get out, you know, and, and be at venues and be able to perform. What type of audience, uh, what type of audiences are you getting these days? Like what type of people are coming out? I mean, it depends on the event. You know, okay. it could be like it could be like a few thousand uh, if I have like a proper manager promoter for the, for the event. I'm not doing a tour like a full tours now where it's like one day after another after another. I'm I, you know I'll I'll fly out do a, do a concert or do a do a private event or do a a fundraiser and then I'll fly back. You know, so one one event at a time kind of thing. 
Sometimes it'll be 300 people in a room, sometimes 500 people in a room. Just really just depends on what I'm playing. And so. you've recorded you've recorded music yourself and you've how many how many albums have you um have you made? Almost two, not a lot. Oh, but I I I have four in the works right now. So I'm like pumping out maybe maybe a song a month or so. So I have a, a violin covers album that's done. It's like that's that's on my website mm-hmm. uh, about 13 songs i've got a uh an original album neon dreams uh, which is i think at 12 songs i should probably be releasing that yesterday at this point so it's an lp <laughs> no that's a full album that's, oh, it's, oh it's a full uh, oh it's a full album yeah it's, i mean it's like 12 12 songs oh you said 12 okay i didn't hear you i thought you said seven i'm sorry uh, yeah yeah about 12 songs so that's like 20 fo- that's like 24 in total between the two albums. And then I got a classical album, which has like four or five classical pieces, like full symphonies. And that's, you know, I'll, I'll, that'll be done probably in like six or seven more symphonies. And then I got a a covers two album, which is like eight songs in. So all that stuff is a lot of that stuff is on uh, my merchandise page on no, my store page. So people can sort of see it. It's your website asherlob.com slash merchandise just asherlob.com okay a-s-h-e-r-l-a-u-b i really and i really yeah. like that you have different so the really cool thing about you is is that if like somebody's coming to listen to your music they have different things that they can find and connect with you know yeah yeah i appreciate you noticing that i you know because my I, dude uh, yeah, I, I love uh, I love EDM. I love electronic. I love instrumental. I love dance music, but I also love classical and I love cinematic music. So I kind of do both. And I'm hoping that more and more of my fans like I find that a lot of my fans like either love one or the other. And I'm a little sad <laughs> about that. But, you know, I just sort of use my pl- my my list and I just sent out messages to anybody who's interested and you need my, uh, uh, mailing list. My dude, you need more stoners. That's that that's the Yeah. Because like we, Yeah, because like I can tell you personally, I can go from I'm that's I can go from like electronic metal to Aretha Franklin to Mama Cass to Jody jo- you know, like Jopla. I, I can just like go through it yeah. because um just the enhancement of sound. The thing is Especially like when you're on a certain high and you listen to a violin, that shrill. Oh my, I could sit in a chair and listen to that shit for like 20 minutes. It's just beautiful. You can hear like yeah. this thrumming going back and forth, like that wavelength. Oh. Well, please send, please send more stoners my way. Bro, right here. You know, like this is a stoner podcast. Like, listen, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta check on Asher Lab. Like, this is next level. 100%. God bless. <sighs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm not like, I don't have the, the stoner persona per se. Uh, so I can see people like not necessarily associating with me, like through my image. Cause it's kind of like a clean type of thing. Yeah, like Alice it's, Cooper is like goth and dark, but he's this super like conservative shrill little like guy. That's, yeah. you know, um, I think it's all about like what you're representing in your music, you know, and, and who you're connecting with. You know, we were talking about this earlier with you were talk, saying about like with audience now, like you're able to connect and find your audience and message and interact. Yeah, that's where you find it. it, it that that's that's the um, that's the meaning that I that I was seeking and that led me away from like the much easier path of just having booking agents just just pay me to show up at events. So so yeah, like I I'd rather earn a living, the same living playing to stoners, if you will. Like people that are deeply in love with the music that I'm producing. Like care about the messages, care about the melodies as opposed to like are just there for their their wallets or to network or or to it's not about as much about the music, you know? And th- that that's all the, like I would take a, I would take a $10,000 cut, you know, in my income to have that deeply meaningful experience of being supported by people that really 
they buy the albums as opposed to just like, you know, rich as hell and just thinking about them themselves and their wallets. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird when you run across artists that just have singles. You know, nothing wrong, like it's great, but they're sometimes nice of having like complete pieces. I have a I have a vinyl record collection. I've got like 300 and something records. Um and I have like, you know, my turntable and my speakers and I sometimes enjoy just like listening to a full album. There's just something just enjoyable about that. I I guess kind of in a way it's a way of having your own little personal concert you know, in, in your own space, you know, your own way of meditating. And I think that's a really great way to capture people and really be able to create that ambiance with audiences, you know? And, so I guess I got to, I got to release the album now. <laughs> Shit, bro. I was like, oh, maybe one more song. And nah, I think it's ready. It's like 13 <laughs> songs in. It's like 13. It's good. It's a good album and it's time to release it and move to the next one. So, uh, that's good. Yeah. It's, you know, I, I'll I, let you know about it. I, I love that. Like just jumping from, you know, creating a project and like, okay, I'm going to put this out there. I, I'm not ready for this shit. Like I am so scared as an artist. I take years to do things. I have art, like I'm dead serious. I have drawings that I haven't finished in like four years. They're just sitting there and I haven't finished them. Yeah. Yeah. So kudos to you. You know, it's, really hard to be creative as an artist and it's really unique to be that type of artist. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you're in a big pool of, uh, of it's, it's common for people to feel like, Oh, you know, it's not perfect. I want, you know, I don't want to have to like live with the, the product and be unhappy with the little, little thing here, a little brushstroke there. I have learned with all my releases that at a point it's it, it 90% good is, is going to have to be good enough for me. Uh, otherwise I'll never release the song and I'll just end up in this endless loop of like, okay, I need to listen to my car like 10 more times, make sure that everything's perfect. I just, I, I'm even with a collaboration, I put a significant amount of effort, even money into, I have learned to like, sort of, it's almost like a skill from my vantage point. Just, you know, it's not going to be 100% perfect. Um, that's where I'm at right now. No, and I think that I think that's a really beautiful thing because it really shows a unique side and not everything in life needs to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. And it definitely helps to have fans that don't need it to be that way. So, you know... It, when you talk about bringing together, like, especially when you have an audience and, you know, you want to connect with people, the thing about, thing about bringing people together, it's not what you're offering, but what they're connecting, you know, like I said earlier, like what they're connecting to, what they're, what they're finding, you know, whether stoners, punkers, emo, disco jockeys, hipsters, bohemian, bohemians, you know, bringing all of those people together in just one room and letting them share their thoughts and their stories. I love that. I think that was Woodstock. And I love how, as my father-in-law, he was at Woodstock, I believe. Pretty sure, yeah. He talks about it a lot. I'm like, was there any violence? He's like, there were, and there was just like women running naked everywhere. Any violence, any rapings, anything? He's like, nothing. Because everybody was just high, stoned. Everybody was just happy. I'm like, and they've been incarcerating these people. Like the, the people who have just been smoking up, getting high, like for bre- breaking up families, throwing dads in jail, like where their kids can't, aren't raised by, they don't see their dad for like 20 years. Like they've been doing this. Like our government has been doing this. And now, now all of a sudden it's legal. It's legal. And not only that, it's medicinal. I it just, I'm not a smoker. But the the idea that families could have were, have been ruined transgenerationally over decades is unbelievable to me. Unbelievable. I can't. I can't. I meant, and it's too late to punish these people. You know, it's funny. I went to I went to Woodstock. Um, I went to that area, and we went. We drove down, and there were like these little shops, and we walked into one of them, and there was this elderly woman that was there. She had like these long braids. And I was just like talking like, you know, I went up there and she's really cool. And she's like, yeah, I remember Woodstock. I made those damn peanut butter jelly sandwiches for two days. 
that was exhausting. I was like, what? She's like, what they did was the locals that were in the area, because there were so many people, they didn't know what they were supposed to do. They had a, they had a factory that made bread and there's a peanut factory that wasn't far from that area. So they had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And she was one of, killing. Yeah, and she was one of those people there that served, you know, like all these people food for like two or three days. The thing the thing is, the thing is as people like try to imagine this. Cannabis is not a miracle drug. It's not going to solve your problems. It's not going to heal your depression. What it does is it 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 opens our minds to something that is so it's so straightforward. Just open yourself up and listen. Listen. It's, it's funny because I've, I've never gotten a high off of cannabis. Uh, I tried really? a couple times. It actually just gave me anxiety, so I just I never really got into it. Oh, it does I that. I don't know why I'm... Huh? It does that. It's called paranoia. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just... I felt weird. I just like... I, I My lower coccyx area just... It hurt, and I just didn't get the, the same high, and I was... I was upset. Like I wanted to be like my friends back in high school, but so unfortunately, uh, yeah, I didn't get any benefits. But but speaking of what you're saying, I mean, just like you got to throw somebody in jail for that stuff. Oh, come on. I know. Jeez. And, I mean, it it inspires so much. I can tell you with the amount of times that I sit and create music, I'm I'm just you know, and it's not just marijuana. I mean, it's anything. It's just getting your element. You know, it's just finding your groove. Yeah, yeah. There you go. I threw it in there. Find there's, 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 there it is. <sighs> I think. Well, this has been quite the groovy time. God, this has definitely been the motherfucking groovy time. And if you want to check out more of Asher, you can find him at asherlab.com. Be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to find more of this podcast, up. yeah, uh, you can find us on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube at Lost in the Groove Pod. So, with that, we'll catch you on the next one, my friends. Stay groovy. All right, I'm going to go. Adios.